tend to forget that they just had a baby, right? Or that they had the baby. <laughs> <laughs> that they had the baby on, you know, March 1st or, or you know, whatever. So, so when they ask these questions, they start thinking about adults. Most of the time is what really happens. They start thinking about adults. When in fact that we need you to think about the children. Why do we need that? Because um, it's important so that we know what are we looking at for child care? What are we looking at for daycare? What are we looking at for elementary school? When we have folks that are in their 50s, like I had somebody tell me, welcome to seniorhood, and I was like, I'm not going. Okay, <laughs> I'm 51, I'm not going there, right? But in 10 years, I'll be going there, right? I'll be 61. And so if folks don't know that I'm here, they don't know necessarily, government doesn't necessarily know how to fund for the age. They don't know who's aging and how many people are aging and looking at the needs for that. So it's more, it, it is kind of the government getting out of your business, but it's just for us to be able to help you in your business. And so if you have, and I will say this too, if you have questions along the way, please feel free to ask them. Um, the census occurs every 10 years, so we'll be seeing this again in 2030. And so you kind of want to remember this because when you start saying, I don't want folks all in my business, and then there's not funding for things, it's because somebody didn't fill out the census form, right? Somebody didn't fill out the census form. So every, every 10 years, the district then occurs, um, we're counting everybody, we're making sure that um, everybody has proper representation in their respective legislative districts, in the House, in the Senate, at the state level, as well as in Congress, in the Senate and in the House of Representatives um, in Congress. And sometimes, it even tweaks down, when I first got on city council, um, sometimes it even tweaks down to the city council level. And for those of y'all who don't know me, I am Angela Williams Grace. <laughs> I'm a delegate. Um, and, um, and I'm running for the Virginia Senate also. But um, um, sometimes it does tweak down into the city council level because we have a board system at the city council level. And so we want to make sure that folks are properly accounted for and that there's not an, an, an overabundance of people in one ward and an un, and, and undercounted in another. Um, so Norfolk had a population shift, all right? We, we lost a few people, and I, I have an opinion about that I'll share with you in a moment. But um, from 242,000 in 2010 to 238,000 in 2020, um, I will tell you that if you recall, the 45th president of the United States halted the counting of the census in October of 2020 as if count, getting folks counted wasn't hard enough during COVID, the president halted the counting of residents uh, for the census in October of 2020. And, and having served as a chair of the census committee when I was on city council, that is a bit from October to December is a very important time because that's when we concentrate on reaching out to the hard to count people, the military, students, those zero to five people, reaching out and targeting those people who have not completed their census forms and helping them for whatever reason to get them going into the communities, getting the homeless folks accountable. We gotta account for the homeless too, right? We gotta account for everybody. And so he um, called for a halt to the census. I kind of thought he should have been sued, but nobody agreed with me, so it is what it is. Um, but we had, um, so, so as a result, I'm gonna tell you, I don't really think the 238,000 number is an accurate number. I really don't. I think at the very least, it's where it was and it made more, okay? Um, but it, it, it's what we have to work with right now for the next 10 years. In 2020, there was a referendum question on the ballot um, as to whether or not there should be a panel to redraw, an independent panel to redraw lines for redistricting, right? So the idea was the people pick the electives, the electives don't get to pick the people, right? Sounds great. Well, 65% of Virginia supported transferring the power to draw the state's congressional and legislative districts from the state legislature to a redistricting commission composed of state legislatures, legislators and citizens. 
All right, that sounds great in theory, but for those of us who are Democrats, we lost Elaine Laurier in Norfolk because of redistricting. She came all the way out of Norfolk because of redistricting and went into Virginia Beach and out of the White Chesapeake and all of that. So we lost, we lost that, right? Um, the redistricting panel consisted of, um, the redistricting panel was established and then if the redistricting panel could not agree, then we had a three judge panel that was created if the, if the redistricting commission could not agree. Um, the commission was created um, by a body that was, we had the referendum, and then um, they were supposed to redraw our, our lines. The, the commission was supposed to redraw the lines in a fair and equitable manner. This is a model of what one of the early redistricting, um, uh, what was it, the last one, Cameron? Was this this one? is the interactive map used for public comment. Okay. During the commission. Perfect. <laughs> That's why we got great stats. Um, so there was a, a public comment period that, um, that was available to citizens to be able to go in look at what the new maps that were being proposed were gonna look like, and then have their, and we blocked out the names of people, but then be able to comment on what they thought of the proposed new districts. Because the redistricting commission couldn't agree. They were like the Hatfields and the McCoys. They could not agree. And so from there, um, it went to a three judge panel um, on the Virginia Supreme Court. And so there was an input, there was an input session um, it was electronic, and um, the panel itself consisted of four members from the House, four members from the Senate, two members from each political party, and then um, eight citizen members who had voted in the past three years um, and had voted, it, who had been registered to vote for the last three years and had voted in the past two elections. So that's your makeup of what that commission looked like when they were formulated. And then since they weren't able to agree, like we said, the Virginia Supreme Court assumed the responsibility and formed a three judge panel in order to come up with districts that were supposed to, depend on if you talk to fair and unbiased, um, but that's a matter of opinion, right? That's a matter of opinion. Um, the decision was based on public comments during the commission hearing period, public comments on the interactive map, public comments submitted to the clerk of court. The judges did not, now this was a big one, the judges did not consider incumbent addresses. So you know, you go back to that, you pick us, we don't pick you, right? So they were not allowed to in, include in their deliberation incumbent addresses. And that created some real problems in our sister city, right? Yes, ma'am. What does incumbent addresses mean? Where I live as the sitting delegate or the sitting senator. Whoever is the sitting delegate or the sitting senator is considered the incumbent. And that person's address for the purposes of drawing them into a district or out of a district or combining them is what was not considered. That make is that not that not clear? Not clear. I know, I know, <laughs> I know. It, it that was what that was that was what we were dealing with, and so um, they they were not considered out. And, a, and 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 one of the best examples I can give you of this, and, and um, Delegate Scott may um, touch on it a little bit, but it's the um, Portsmouth, Chesapeake, Lionel and Louise Senate race. That race that they were drawn together, their addresses were not considered and therefore they were drawn together. And so they are in, and we'll talk a little bit about primary, they're in primary race themselves. Um, current districts. Um, so understand this, this is really important because I know you all have gotten stuff from the State Board of Elections telling you you have new districts, you got new this, you got new that, you haven't yet, but 
Understand that your current elected officials represent you through December 31st of 2023. We are elected, we took an oath through the end of this year, all right? So when we talk about election, just remember your current folks, your people are your people until the end of this year, okay? Now, because of elections and because of the new district and because of the residency requirements for you to run in a district, some folks did have to resign their seat because the districts they were running in, they had to live in in order to run for them and the lines were tweaked and so they, um, they couldn't stay where they were and run where they were going to be. They had to be where they were going to be in order to run there, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Some, of them, Some of them had to move. Some of them had to move. When we file our declaration, we have to certify that we live at the address, that that address is within the district that we're running in. Even though these lines and these districts don't take effect until January 1st. Okay, all right. So I didn't say it was fair. I just said that's the message. Not the way it is. Don't shoot the messenger. So who are your current Norfolk House district? You got um, Delegate Jackie Glass in the 89th, which is the current 89th. You've got me in the 90th, and then you've got Delegate Rob Bloxham in the 100th. One of the individuals who had to move to be able to run in the new district because this new district doesn't have any part of Norfolk now is Nadarius Clark. Wonderful young man who ran, I think he was like the youngest delegate to the youngest person to um, ever be elected to the House of Delegates. And then um, Tim Anderson, um, he was he is running in a Senate district that does not overlap his current House district. So he moved and resigned to be able to run in the Senate district. I am very fortunate and blessed that my House district is within the Senate district that I'm running for, so I didn't have to go anywhere. Y'all still got me. <laughs> Y'all still got me. Um, and then the Senate districts, um, our current senators, so this is important in terms of the new 21st Senate district, which we'll talk about a little bit later. <coughs> Del, uh, Senator Spruill is in district number five. He represents Norfolk and Chesapeake. He is known as the senator from Chesapeake. Senator Linwood Lewis, he represents a little bit of Norfolk and the Eastern Shore. He is known as the Senator from the Eastern Shore. And then Senator Aaron Rouse, who flipped the Jane Kiggin seat, he has about three precincts in Norfolk and the rest of his district is in Virginia Beach. He is known as the Senator from Virginia Beach. Now, if y'all were paying attention, is anybody known as a Senator from Norfolk? No. But they all represent a part of Norfolk. I know, right? So, the new district. District 21 is the Senate district that I am running for. It is newly drawn. It is mostly, it, it's all Norfolk with the exception of six precincts. Um, I had to write those, I had to keep those in my file. Okay, so this, the precincts, one, two, three, four, five, the five. The five precincts that are not in this Senate District are Bayview, Third Presbyterian, Tarleton, Little Creek, and East Ocean View. If you voted any of those cents in any of those districts, they are not in the 21st Senate District. They are in the 22nd Senate District with Bill to Staff. So he has those five, those five precincts, and then the rest of his district is Virginia Beach. Do you have the numbers for them? So you did the names? <coughs> I have the names, I do not have the numbers. You mean of the of the precincts? Yeah, because this it says on my card precinct five oh six. What did, and what else does it say? Ocean View Center. Okay, Ocean View Center. It's now north side. Which is in the district. Yep. Which is in the district. Yeah, if that's north side, if your precinct is not Bayview, Third Press, Tarleton, Little Creek, or East Ocean View. You are in the 21st, you will be, come January 1st, in the 21st Senate District, all right? You will be. And then um, District 20 is um, parts of Ocean View, 
all East Beach and parts of Virginia Beach and the Eastern Shore, that's gonna be Bill DeSteffs. District 92 includes parts of the former District 77, 89, and 90. So District 92 is, um, is, a, vacant, is a vacant seat because some of the lines got drawn differently. That was the old 89. 92 was the old 89. Y'all remember Jay Jones? That was the old 89. Then district number 93 includes former districts 79, 89, 90, and 100. That was the old 90th district, pretty much, all right, which is the district I currently represent. So the 93rd is, the, is pretty much the current 90th, okay? Because they, they just blocked out a couple of neighborhoods, quite frankly. They could have left it alone. Um, <laughs> House District 94 includes former part, includes parts of former 79, 83, 89, 90, and 100. And House District 95 includes former districts 83, 85, and 90. Phil, what is your district? 94. 94. So we got Phil Hernandez. He's Democratic nominee for the um, House District 94. Okay. And now that one's new, right? Brand new. That one is new. All right, so that, that's a new one. So for Norfolk, all right, which is my baby, Norfolk did okay in redistricting, right? We, we didn't do bad, because we got all of our Senate folks really consolidated, and then we've got, right, we only have one district that's got, well, we've got two that have part of Virginia Beach or part of, one of them's got a little bit of South Norfolk, right? So we did really well in, um, in redistricting, even though they stopped counting early. We did, we did okay. Um, primary elections. So primary election day is June 20th, 2023. That is when the Democratic and the Republican nominees will be on the ballot and you will select between whoever's on the ballot to be the representative for the Democratic nomination and the Republican nomination. If you are less like Phil and nobody else filed for the Democratic nomination, then that person's name will not be on the ballot in June because they had no other competition, if you will, for that Democratic or Republican nomination. And they're, they go straight, they, they go straight to, what is it? Go, not go to jail, but you collect $200. <laughs> <laughs> don't forget to go straight to jail, don't collect $200. Don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. go to where, collect your $200, and go, yeah, go straight to jail. It's been forever since I played Monopoly, right? So <laughs> um, that's our primary election. Early voting, early voting. If you recall, Democrats were responsible for um, making sure we had early voting, and a lot of other states had done this for years. So there's 45 days of early voting. So starting on May 5th, you go right down to City Hall, and, you, and, and they made it really convenient. You don't have to go up the elevator and all that other nonsense. You go right there, they're on the first floor. You can vote from, I, I believe it's 9.30 to 5 o'clock. You can vote. 9 to 5. 9 to 5, thank you. 9 to 5, you can vote um, up until June 17th. And then the two Sundays prior to June 20th, our, our um, electorate will be open at City Hall and you can go in and you can vote early. So there's the opportunity for you to vote in the primary and you don't have to wait until June 20th. Yes, sir. Right. It's actually two Saturdays, not Sundays. Those are the days. Two Saturdays? Yep. June Saturday. 10th and June 17th. Thank you. Two right. Saturdays, June 10th and mm -hmm. June 17. 17. Right, last thank, you. thank you so much. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I had to double check it with my fact checker, but thank you. Now, I'm working, <laughs> so I know. Oh, cool beans. Okay, great. Great. Right. So great. Yeah. Who had questions? Who had a question? I saw a hand and I'll get to your hand. Yes. Um, I'm a Democrat. Can I vote in the Republican primary to affect who's going to be on the ballot? I would say that would be unethical. Yeah, I would say so. Right. <laughs> I can't tell you it's illegal, but I would say that it's unethical. Right. You, you can't do it, right? You can't, but you can only vote one. You have to pick either Republican or uh, Democrat. Well, if one candidate's running unopposed, why, why would I vote for that? You know, I still need to vote for the candidate. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, would, I would go with that would be enough. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question. 
Yes, sir. Is early morning going to be open only at City Hall this time? Yes, only at City Hall this time. For the crowd here. For the crowd here. Yes. We will more than likely have satellite elections for the satellite locations in general. But one of the things that I will tell you to also do is consider working um, as an election worker. We are short, we are down, we are easy, we need help. Um, if you are able to give us your service as an election official and work, I don't mean, I, I mean to working for a candidate if you choose to volunteer for that, but also working for the State Board of Elections as an election official, that would be very, very helpful because we do not have, I mean, opening up satellite locations is great for the public, but it requires people to be there. And the numbers of satellite places that we're able to open up is directly impacted by the numbers of people that we have and the times that we have to, to be able to actually um, man and staff those locations. So that's something that's very important. So if you're able to do it, or if you know someone that's able to do it, please encourage them to, to volunteer. And I, at, at, the, at the state level, they do pay you. It's a little bit of dollars, but it's better than, it's better than having to just, you know, volunteer. The winners of the, of the June primary will then go on to be on the ballot in November. And then um, the winners of the November election take office in January of 2024. And that's when the actual districts go into effect in January of 2024. So I have a birthday on January the 12th, and I am asking, usually sessions start somewhere around there, so I'm asking for a birthday gift, and they get an offer to Senator for my birthday. Um, <laughs> Um, the Senate district represents about 215,000 people, and the House districts represent approximately 86,000 people. And so um, this, is, this, this, is, this is really major, but for Norfolk, it's really a great thing because um, this is the history of the senators who have been the senators from Norfolk. The history of the senators. The senators that have been known, you remember the three I mentioned, right? And none of them are known as a senator from Norfolk. These are the three, starting with Senator Yvonne Miller um, back in 1988, and I'm sorry, back in 1984 when she went to the House of Delegates, and in 1988 when she went to the Senate, then on to our mayor who was served in the Senate from 2016 to, from 2012 to 2016, and now um, Senator Spruill, who served from 2016 to the present. Um, though for the last 34 consecutive years, the city of Norfolk has really been represented by an African-American senator. And this district is a minority majority district. So now, um, I have the pleasure of having our minority leader, our, our Democratic caucus leader, Delegate Don Scott from Portsmouth, um, he's going to talk a little bit with you about the implications of the upcoming elections as it pertains to the House of Delegates and how that impacts how this election and the primaries impact um, the overall control of what happens up in Richmond. Um, he's going to hobble up. Hmm. <laughs> no empathy. Would you like a chair, sir? Doug and Don Scott. when people could start to see that the Democrats may get the majority. 
to understand this. I need y'all to understand this. The Republicans in the House of Delegates had held the majority uninterrupted for 20 years straight. I know y'all don't even understand that, right? Y'all, that's unfathomable, right, in Virginia, right? You would not believe that. 20 years straight. And the reason that was is because when Andrew was talking about the census early on, and when that data comes in, at that time, the legislature drew the maps. And whoever was the most powerful and who was in charge, common sense, self, self preservation is the first law of nature. So you draw the maps in a way that would be advantageous for you to return. As long as it fell within the law. There's Section 5, Voting Rights Act, federal law that they would have to comply with. And for the most part, they did. Um, that's to protect the rights of minorities and others because of the go back to the South of the 60s, voting rights. Um, and so in 2019, also after they did that, there was another lawsuit, lawsuit uh, filed, the Bethune Hill case that went to the state Supreme Court. And the Bethune Hill case said that some of the maps had been drawn in a way as to deprive African Americans of their right to choose their own uh, representatives. And so immediately the Supreme Court appointed what they called a special master. And um, the special master came in and redrew some maps. Um, some of the maps that affected the majority of uh, African American communities and made them fair. Um, the map, the city I lived in at the time, I mean, I live in Portsmouth, I represent Portsmouth. Portsmouth, the, the, the representative, the delegate at that time was Matthew James. Matthew James had a part of Suffolk and gerrymandered all of Part of Suffolk, part of Norfolk, part of Portsmouth, part of downtown Norfolk, all jacked up. Y'all don't even know who Matthew is, right? No, okay, so y'all do. And so um, then he resigned. So, and that's how I did. And when the map was redrawn, they put me, I had previously not been in his district. And the map was redrawn where I lived in Portsmouth, was drawn into that district, and he resigned. And that's when I won't go out after we were elected in the November 19, the Democrats took the House for the first time in 20 years. At that point, we decided that um, that referendum, because this is the way a constitutional amendment has to be added to the ballot. It has to be voted on in two consecutive general assemblies. The same exact language cannot be changed. Change the language a little bit, you start over. So for a constitutional amendment to happen, it had to have been voted on that spring of 2019 when I told you I wasn't there. Then it had to be voted on again in the spring of 2020. I was there. In the spring of 2020, I did not support the Constitutional Amendment as it was written because I was worried that it would leave out the majority of minority community. And I did not trust the process. And just kind of glossed over it. The process it broke down. I didn't think y'all understand. What happened was, she talked about there had to be four members from the Senate, four members from the House, the six, whatever the number was, some citizen uh, members who had voted, and then some other folks. When you, and the majority of, so three fourths of the House and Senate had to vote and approve whatever maps came out. Now y'all know ain't no three fourths politicians. <laughs> Both sides of the aisle going to agree on nothing. Okay? So they did this whole redistricting hearings, took public comment, did all this big show, and at the end of the day, the legislation said we're going to default to the, to the Virginia Supreme Court to draw the map. And I was always wary of that, knowing that. Judges were appointed by the legislature, and it had been Republican controlled for a long time, and the majority of those on the Supreme Court had been um, appointed by Republicans. In fact, one of the members of the Supreme Court right now, her, her brother, who's deceased, I may mean, rest in peace, but he was a state senator right at that time, and she was on the Supreme Court, and he was a Republican. And I was like, oh, 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 what do you think they're going to be talking about at Thanksgiving dinner? <laughs> you know, and so I had some issues with that, with, that, um, with that arrangement, and I knew that no politicians would agree, and I knew that it would come back down to the Supreme Court making the decision. The Supreme Court, to their credit, because I was definitely, I was wailing on this hard, because I was trying to make sure that they didn't do it. Sometimes you got to complain so much that you let them know you're watching. So what they did was they appointed what they call a special master. So the same special master come in from academia who's drawn maps all over the country, they agreed on, some names were submitted, and the Supreme Court agreed on one particular special master. 
and this special master came in and drew these maps that we currently have now. And some of the things that we were concerned about actually happened. You got Lionel Spruill and Louise Lucas now in the same district. These are old veterans that have been in Jim Simmons forever with these maps that are gonna go. I heard some of y'all rust tussling with the fact that what Angela said, when they considered drawing maps, they said, we will not take into account where any incumbent lives. So when we draw these maps, we're just gonna draw the maps as fair as we can. We're not gonna look at where anybody lives. So if you've had someone who has seniority in your district that's been elected for a long time and they're a senior on the committee, they're appropriations chair or conferee, that means they deal with the money and the budget and they can bring home the bait. We're not gonna consider that, that expertise that you've been voting on all that time, you're gonna lose that because we're not gonna take into account. We're gonna take into account communities of interest, we're gonna take into account contiguousness, and we're gonna take into account, but we won't take into account any income from dress. And that's how we got people having to move, people having to retire, people having to resign, because when you do a statement of organization, you have to declare where you live, or a declaration of candidacy, you have to put on the address that you're going to be living at on the day of the election. You can't do that if you don't live in that district. So people had to move and they'll resign so they can move into the new district that they wanted to represent. That's how we got there. As we speak right now, there are, there are 40 members of the Virginia Senate. Of those 40 now, we, are, we know that are coming back. We know that there are at least 13 vacancies now that won't come back. Incumbent, those seats are vacant. The way the new districts were drawn, we know we're gonna start out with at least 13 new folks. That's before we get primary, before the people lose and all that, at least 13. In the House of Delegates, we know we're going to start out with at least uh, 31 and 35. What's that? 66? At least. Oh, that number's wrong. That's why I messed up. 34, my bad. 30, because people keep dropping. Yeah. People keep dropping. And so we're going to start out right now, as of today, we're going to start out with at least 34 out of 100 new members. Look how much subject matter expertise and history you lose and representation you lose. That's how uh, hectic chaotic this process has been. There is something to be said about bringing in an independent person to draw the maps and try to be as fair as you can, but there's also something to be said about the people who have built that expertise being involved in drawing those maps to make sure you get fair maps. And I think we could have got fair maps another way. That's just my opinion. I didn't vote for this to be just a minute because I didn't believe, I, because I thought what we have right now, the chaos that we have right now, is un, it's unheard, it's unheard of never happened before in Virginia history. But well, we're gonna come in with at least, at least before an election is held, at least 34 members. Now mind you, of those 66 seats right now, probably half of them, or no, I answer, at least a third have primaries. More than a third have primaries, which some of those people are not coming back. So they're gonna lose in the primary. Because that's just the nature of the beast right now. So we got a lot of, of things going on. Um, at the, at the end of the day, this next election is going to tell us where we are on our priorities and our values. One of the things I tell people all the time, the first thing you gotta look at, I know we like to talk about all of the hot button social cultural issues, which are very important. You know, women's reproductive health, bodily autonomy, very important, number one. I'm married, I got a 14 year old daughter. I don't wanna live in a world where my daughter has less rights than she had, than my mother. That doesn't make any sense. Um, we want to make sure that we have a first class education and, and fully fund SOQs, which we don't do. We had done, we're about three, four hundred million dollars short of fully funding status of quality, which means that we give every, all the staff, we put in everything that we need. We have a governor that's saying, I want to do a four hundred million dollar tax cut for, for corporations. He can, he, we can fund our schools. Your budget is your values. You know what I mean? And, and, I, and, I, and those hot button issues kind of, we get lost and we gotta understand the budget and, and, and that's very important. And this next election is gonna tell you where you put your dollars. Who's gonna get to uh, benefit from our economy? Who's gonna be able to have great jobs? I need y'all to understand, when we were in the majority, for the little two years we were in the majority, we raised the minimum wage from 7.25 to eight to nine to 11 now to 12. And now it's stopped. We have to vote on it again. We have a reenactment clause. We have to vote on it to get it to fifteen dollars an hour. That's supposed to be the living wage. You would be shocked to see how many people come marching into the to the city just to ask for fifteen bucks an hour. Some of y'all will slit y'all wrists if y'all make fifteen bucks an hour. But there are families being raised on fifteen bucks an hour. 
And that's the minimum. That's all. And we're not there yet as Virginia. We need to get there. But Republicans voted to repeal the minimum wage last session <coughs> and passed it in the House. But for the Senate, it wouldn't have become law. So I need to understand how important these, these are, these next elections are. There are so many things on the ballot. They want to ban, they want to ban. Uh, remember the first thing that you've been saying that? They, the, the abortion pill that's going on, you know, they ban women's right to have bodily autonomy and deal with their own doctors and make their own health. I just had a knee surgery, all right? I had to have a municipal tablet pad. You know who wasn't in the office with me and my doctor? No politician. <laughs> well, no politician in that. I didn't listen to their opinion. I didn't take, they didn't tell me what medicine I was gonna take and not gonna take. I didn't have to listen to what they brought on, whether I should take this medication or have that surgery was good for me. It's healthcare is between me and my physician and my family. And I think there are a lot of people who want to try to control people and they're trying to take us back. And we need to continue to go forward. So uh, the next election, there's so much at stake. We're in the minority now. We have a 50, uh, the Republicans in the House have a 52-48 advantage, all right? Now I need y'all to understand something. In the new seats that were drawn, Joe Biden won 60 of those seats. That's in the vast majority, right? If we come out, but I need y'all to understand. Also in those seats, Glenn Youngkin won 52 of those seats. So there are some Youngkin, I don't know, I ain't done before, but there are some Youngkin Biden voters. And those are the people that scare the hell out of me. Because that means that they are willing to go along with a nice guy who will also hurt families, hurt workers, and hurt women, hurt children. Um, so I would love to see um, what's going to happen in this next election. We are confident that we're going to take back the majority. We have the numbers. Uh, if, if we take back the majority, yours truly, when we take back the majority, I don't want, to talk, I don't want this to go viral. He was talking about they were gonna win. <laughs> when and if we take back the majority, yours truly has a very strong chance of being the Speaker of the House. I'm the minority leader now in the House of Delegates. I will become the Speaker. Um, you know the history of Virginia. You never had an African American Speaker, and uh, it would be a pretty big deal. Uh, but that's not why I'm talking about that. I'm talking about it because the Speaker has a lot of authority, boards. Commissions, education, who appoints to what committees, what bills get docketed. Like they, the speaker can literally, somebody can introduce a bill, and the speaker can say, that bill ain't going to committee. It's not going to hit. We're not going to hit. And the speaker this year did that on some, a lot, several bills. He's like, nah, we're not going to hit it. He, they call it, he just put that thing in his pocket. They call that a pocket veto. They never got to hear But that's the authority that comes with the speakership, and it's important. I got down in the middle. I got to understand where would Virginia be had not the Republicans in the House been in charge for 20 straight years. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what they are. 20 straight years, even though the population growth in Nova and Hampton Roads and blah blah blah. 20 straight years. So I think we have an opportunity. That's why you cannot get excited about well Trump's gone and then people stop voting because that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Trump left and everybody thought they killed the boogeyman. Man named Doc. He's like Jason, he back. Watch Friday the 13th, some kind of way Jason come out of the water again. He thought the man was dead. Man got shot seven times and stabbed 20 times. And burned up. And he come out of the water. And so that's what we have. But not only does we have that him personally, but those ideas are out. And they become even more flagrant and more aggressive. And the only thing that teaches them a lesson of what they can do and what cannot do, it curbs that. That, that extremism is focused. That's the only thing. When you start talking about gun violence prevention, we introduced so many gun violence prevention bills. We introduced a bill, now this is common sense. Might have saved them little kids in Newport News from being in the mess with their mom too. We introduced a bill that says, if you own a gun in your house and you have children in the home, you have to secure that firearm in the house. Is that radical? <laughs> you got kids in the house, keep your gun locked up in the house. Well, won't you know it's radical in the matter of extremism? That bill got killed so quick it made your head spin. And you know what they did pass? They said, well, what we do is we just bipartisan. We had a colleague who introduced a bill that said, we're going to introduce a tax credit. You get a tax credit if you go and buy a place to secure your firearm. So we want to incentivize and do a tax credit. Now, you know a lot of people not doing that because you got to spend money to get the credit. But if you mandate it, 
How much? How many of you want kids like? That's the number one cause of death for children right now. Yes. Gun violence. Yes. And we're not doing a dang thing about it. And you know what? My daughter, she's 14, she don't believe any of y'all gonna do anything about it. She don't think y'all gonna show up to the, to the polls. Y'all don't show up when you get mad. Somebody make y'all mad, y'all show up. But to be sustainable over a period of time, you gotta show up every single election. All right, I can't entertain any questions. <laughs> <laughs> any, any questions for the speaker? I mean, the leader? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get there, y'all. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so I heard that you were like a veteran. I am a veteran. Oh, okay. Service Warfare Officer Navy. Okay. I'm old. Matter of fact, this is Mr. Tap. I got this on the USS John Hancock. No, I tore both of them years ago, coming down. Boom, landed, and I heard these things. Like, and when you out at sea in the Gulf, you know what they tell you? Go wrap the things up in some ice. You got bed with us for a few days. I had bed with a few days. We stay watching them. So yeah. And I had the con, and about a, about a week later, I was back on the walk. I was back standing watching, I had the con. And guess what? My knees, are, you know, you just get strong. And over time, they, they heal up, they do better. But I didn't want to get cut on them until recently. So I had the left one cut about two years ago, and this one cut about, about four weeks ago. That's all right. I'm, I'm, I get, you get old. That's all. I don't pay, when I was young, I ain't paid no mind. If you got older, them things don't, you don't bounce back and forth. Okay, so I don't want to know, like, what was your race? I was surface walk off. Change, change, change. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't count for it. Oh. Anything else? Anything else? Yes, sir. Yeah, well, when is uh, Virginia planning on catching up with our neighbor states for being record friendly? Veteran friendly? I'm glad you're, I think we all catching up. I think we're getting a little bit better. I introduced the bill and it passed and the government signed surprisingly, whereby, um, cause I'm very, you know, focused on making sure I'm a member of DAV and BFW and American Legion, life member. And want to make sure that we continue to, cause we got so many veterans. And I'm from Texas originally. And Texas got so much that they do, but we, they so much bigger. And Texas got all this all money. So I went to Texas A&M University, undergrad. And so what happens in Texas is, if you are a veteran and you enroll and you enlisted from Texas, either enlisted or went in as an officer from Texas, when you come home, Texas will pay your tuition at any state school. And I think that's something that I'm planning on introducing next year in Virginia. I think we can do it with, with the budget surplus we have now. The bill that I passed this year was there was a that as a veteran right now, if a disabled vet, you're eligible to get. Um, your um, the tax money that you pay, you get the tax money back on the sale of a home when you buy a home. But you know when you do the escrow and then they do the estimated taxes for the year, you have to put that in escrow so you can you have to pay that amount in advance. So what I did was pass a bill that says now you don't have to pay that anymore in advance. They can reduce it, which now you have more money to go towards your purchase and less money to have to put down. And that bill passed. So I think there are more things that we're doing. We this year we passed uh, another bill that. Uh, raise the amount of income exemption for veterans in the state. So less of your uh, retirement pay is taxable. We passed that this year. So there are more things that we're gonna continue to do. And I, and, and I, and I think that's a, I think you, you, you own to something. I've got a catch on the head, um, state on the uh, taxes for the uh, military retirement. A, no, it's not, it's a, it's a cap. So I think it's up to, I wanna say 55 or 60,000, but you know what? That's a good question. I'm gonna look that up and I'll get it to Angela. Cause one of the things I think we need to do is, and, and I know we have a, a the, the state has a site, but we just, that bill just passed. It takes effect July one, where it puts a cap on uh, veterans retirement. And we're gonna probably do more in that respect. And every year we're doing more and more and more to help make sure that we protect our veterans. The way I read it was, in order to get that though, you have to be 55. And my question is, what about for those of us under the age of 55? Other states are doing, and we and we and we talked about that too. It may be an H. I don't remember what if that's an age cap. It may be, 55. but 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 if it is one, I want to know because I don't go from memory and I don't like to guess. I don't like to pull stuff out of my. You know what I mean? I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't like to guess. Yeah, and and and, and you're right. And that's one of the things that we need to talk about. Because there are some very young veterans who did 20 years or, eight, or 20. They went in at 18 and young at 38. Blah blah blah. So that's the thing we can we can definitely take a look at. And it, and it, and it, and it, and it, we ain't. Maybe something we'll take around. It does look attractive to me, too. We'll take, we'll take a look at it before you run off. Let's see what we can do next session. Let's see what we can do next session.
You're going to talk to your center, but she might carry the bill. What else y'all for? Any other questions, ma'am? So um, I am a part of a nonprofit organization called United Justice, and we do a lot with um, criminal justice reform, prison reform, things of that nature. And um, I'm going to switch the conversation a little bit because I have a couple of concerns about some things that happened. Um, the budget amendment did change the earth census credit for some of our uh, women and women that thought they were going to come home. And then very recently, the, the, the voting